and welcome to The Spectrum Show, a show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Welcome to the last episode in this series. I'll be back shortly with all new episodes, and there's some good things coming up. But back to this episode. We go back to October 1984 to get all the latest Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games. And in an end-of-series special, we take a look at the games of Imagine Software. But first, it's back into the time machine. Sinclair's profits have not risen as high as expected, coming in at just 14.28 million, a rise of only £253,000. Sir Clive put the disappointing results down to the QL issues as outlined in previous episodes, and the development of the pocket television. Despite this though, turnover has risen by an impressive 42% to £77 million, which was put down to high demand for the Spectrum, both in the UK and overseas. Ultimate Play the Game are to release two follow-ups to their successful game Saberwolf. The first, Underworld, sees Saberman doing battle through hundreds of screens, and the second, Nightlaw, is said to be, according to Ultimate, the first step in a new generation of computer adventure simulations. I wonder what they could mean. Sinclair have surprised customers by releasing a new micro, the Spectrum Plus. The machine features a fully moving keyboard and is not so much a new machine, but the same Spectrum components in a new stylish case. The case design is in line with the new QL system, featuring nice black sculpted keys and a reset button something that many Spectrum owners really needed. Ocean Software have purchased the name and remaining rights to Imagine Software, who recently went into liquidation, and is featured in this month's special. Ocean say they will use the label to sell prestige titles, and have also employed several ex-Imagine programmers including John Gibson and the team that were working on the Mega Games. Activision have secured the license to produce computer games based on the upcoming film Ghostbusters. The game will feature characters and music from the film, and be a mix of arcade and strategy. Continuing with tie-ins, and Argus Press has acquired the rights to produce games based on the Ridley Scott film Alien. The game will be a strategy game, allowing you to control the ship and command the members of the crew in a bid to outwit the alien. The game will be released for the Commodore and Spectrum. BT's budget label Firebird will see an impressive release of games, costing just £2.50 each. The games for the Spectrum include Run Baby Run, Menace, Wild Bunch, Mr. Freeze, Exodus, Booty, Terra Force and Viking Raiders. And that's the news, and now on to the top selling games. First we have Daily Thompson's Decathlon. Ocean gave us their answer to track and field starring the famous Olympic Decathlon hero. Mind Games brings us American football. Gridiron comes to the Spectrum. Houston released their 3D arcade adventure Avalon, where you take control of Marok the Wizard in his quest to banish the Lord of Chaos. Elite Systems brings us Cockatoni Wolf. You play Wolf who has to search the parts of the amulet through various time zones. Melbourne House finally released Sherlock Holmes and gives us yet another adventure game, this time based on Arthur Conan Doyle's Detective. And finally US Gold released Beachhead, an arcade war game featuring multiple levels as you try to reach and blow up the gun emplacement. And that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from October 1984. Imagine Software were one of the pioneering companies to emerge into the game scene, and went on to take advantage of the hype and media to portray a mega successful business. Initially formed in November 1982 by ex-employees of neighbouring Liverpool-based Bugbyte Software, the founding members Mark Butler, Eugene Evans and Dave Larson sprang into the limelight with their very first game. The company grew, but eventually became a victim of its own hype. In the same blaze of publicity, they spectacularly went bust, highlights of which were caught by a TV documentary crew filming the now infamous Commercial Breaks programme. Although an important story, this feature is not about the details of the trials and tribulations of Imagine. Instead, we're going to focus on the software, in particular, the games. 
The dates of release are best estimates, based on the first reviews and editorials in magazines, but are hopefully as accurate as I can get them. Their very first game was one that set them on their way and built up a large sum of money, allowing the company to survive. Arcadia was the shoot 'em up, and although the game is average by today's standards, at the time of its release the market was in its infancy. You control the starship Arcadia, defending the planet from the invading Atarian nation, a nod towards the game console company rapidly taking over the home games market. Arcadia shot up the charts and was a firm favourite with many gamers. The game remained in the top 10 for over 6 months, bringing in the company's much needed money. Where other similar games at the time had character based graphics, jerky movement and poor sound, this game delivered smooth graphics, good sound, great player explosions and bags of playability. Different levels with changing alien types and attack patterns was head and shoulders above the current batch of poor games. Each level lasted a set time, with a counter in the top left indicating how much of the time was left. Should you destroy all the aliens before the time limit ended, a further attack wave was started. This gave the game two strategies. You could kill everything in sight for a high score, or kill everything except one or two and wait for the timer to run out. The only problem with this last option was that sometimes the lasers fired by themselves, meaning you could inadvertently destroy the last alien when you didn't want to, and then another attack wave comes down. Today it's still not a bad game to play, if you can ignore the flickering graphics and seemingly random occasions when the ship moves and fires on its own. With their first hit on the market, all eyes were turned to the follow-up. How could their second release match up to Arcadia? Well, the answer was, it couldn't. Schizoids was released in May 1983, and the cover art made promises the game just couldn't deliver. Sadly the game was pretty poor, and it was a cross between asteroids and crazy comets, with flickering wireframe graphics and poor game mechanics. You have signed up to be a space dustman, and you have to push debris into a black hole. Being a black hole, however, means it can also pull you in, so you have to be sure to keep clear. Various wireframe objects like cubes and triangles appear at random places, and your space dozer has an anti-momentum shovel that can withstand direct hits, and can be used to shunt these into the black hole. Sadly, the rest of your ship is unprotected, and the slightest collision will destroy it. The controls are like those for asteroids where you can rotate left and right and thrust. You've also got an option to flip the ship through 180 degrees, so you can apply reverse thrust if required. Using these you have to manoeuvre your ship behind the objects and give them a little push into the black hole. Like asteroids, the screen wraps, however it sometimes doesn't follow the rules of physics. Most of the time you can leave one side and enter on the other, but sometimes you can't, and sometimes you just explode. Your space dozer also explodes for no reason when you're pushing an object, and it often vanishes from the screen for a few seconds, leaving you wondering where it will appear from. The game idea was fine, but the execution was a little off the mark, and most of the time you spend just avoiding the objects, hoping they'll fall into the black hole themselves, and hoping that something doesn't come along and destroy your ship. All in all, then, it was a bit of a letdown. Next to be released were three games, all arriving between April and June 1983. Moving away from the typical arcade games came R. Diddums. This cute collect up saw you playing a teddy bear that had to escape from a series of toy boxes to be allowed to comfort a crying child. To get out of the box, Teddy had to collect blocks and use them to build stairs. The blocks were different colours and had to be placed in the right order to correctly build the stairs to allow him to get out. Of course it wasn't that easy, and the other toys were out to stop him. Teddy had objects he could use, for example a beach ball or a pea shooter, that when thrown or fired would destroy the other toys. He also had a friend in Jack in the Box. If he bumped into Jack, the other toys would stop and fall asleep for a short while, allowing Ted to go about his business. If you destroyed all of the toys, however, a large lump of plasticine arrives, which cannot be killed, and chases Ted around the toy box. The game boasted 99 levels, or toy boxes to get through, so it's not an easy game to complete. The graphics were nice and cute and well drawn, but like earlier games tended to flicker. Gameplay wise it certainly improved on schizoids, and was actually quite nice to play. The difficulty level was about right, and the only problem was trying to line the blocks up correctly. 
This usually involved standing somewhere near the steps and repeatedly dropping and collecting the blocks until they appeared in the right order and allowed you to move to the next level. As the levels progress, the screen becomes full of more and more nasty toys. And the first thing that you do is go for the beach ball. This can bounce several times, taking out several toys in one go. There's also a small train at the top right of the screen, and if allowed to get across, any blocks placed there will be scattered back around the toy box. Overall, this is quite a fun game to play, and set the tone for the other two releases. Mola Mall was supposedly inspired by a trip to the dentist, and saw the player controlling a toothbrush trying to ward off the invading germs, or as the inlay states, the DK Menace. Obviously a sneak dig aimed at their rival's DK Tronics. The game was, despite being original, only mediocre at best. DK floated around, latching onto teeth and slowly changing their colour until eventually the tooth dies. A toothpaste tube provides a cleaning agent, Magico Toothpaste, that has to be collected on the brush and taken to the worst damaged tooth and brushed on. Now and again a sweet would appear, causing more problems as these feed the DK menace. The graphics are nice and smooth, and there's some nice carnival type music that plays, but the main problem is trying to get the brush lined up with the toothpaste tube to get paste out, and unless you are pixel perfect you won't get any. Overall the game is quite playable, only marred by the problem of aligning the brush, and the fact that the only sound played is the tune, otherwise it'll pass a few minutes, but it certainly isn't up there with the best of imagined games. Last of the three was Jumping Jack, probably the best game of the set really, just for playability alone. You control Jack, a small stick man, that won't tell you his rhyme unless you help him to get to the top of the screen. To get to the top you have to guide Jack through a series of holes that move across horizontal platforms. Once at the top, Jack will tell you a line from his rhyme and the next screen begins. As each level's completed, further hazards are added, including aeroplanes and men with guns and blue ghosts, and more enemies appear as each level is completed. Colliding with any of these will knock Jack out for a few seconds, and if he's unlucky during this time, a hole will come along underneath him, sending him crashing down to the next level, again knocking him out for a couple of seconds. Timing is everything with this game, as is a little bit of luck. Falling down once is okay, but if the holes line up correctly, you could find yourself right back down to the bottom of the screen again, in which case you lose a life. Jumping Jack is a great game, and many players still like it, and I got caught up during this review and lost a good 30 minutes or so. You just have to go back and try again. Unbeknown to everyone in the industry, this young company that had created all of these games so far had little less than a year left. And as June ended and July arrived, Imagine gave us two more games, available in larger boxes if you had the extra cash. Zip Zap, released in July 1983, was a sort of mad Robotron style game, but without the finesse of the arcade game. The idea was that you were a sole surviving robot of a pre-colonisation team, sent to a remote planet to prepare it for habitation. And luckily the natives were not happy about this and started attacking. To make things worse, the robot was damaged and couldn't stop moving. So basically you control a continually moving robot around the screen, avoiding or shooting nasties whilst collecting fuel cells. Once you collect four fuel cells, that will give you enough power to transport to the next level. The screen is full of angry aliens of different types that meander about, and colliding with them reduces your energy. If your energy reaches zero, the game ends. Should you complete the level, part of your energy is replenished, and it all starts again with a different set of aliens. The graphics are basic, with aliens, although animated, being dull shapes with little definition. As mentioned before, you have got a laser to fire, although it often seems useless, and the best policy is not to run into aliens at all, but try and dodge them instead. The game, given the hype that went along with it, was uninspiring for me, unlike its sibling though, advertised around the same time. Zoom sees you flying the fastest craft known to man, and you head off with the sole aim of protecting refugees from genocide. Not an ideal game scenario, 
and I'm sure something better could have been thought of. Your ground skimmer, that's what your vehicle's called, is equipped with lasers and missiles, and both are needed depending on the enemy at hand. Initially it's planes, but later levels include submarines and tanks. With these new enemies come different terrain, with three variations, green landscape, desert and ocean. As the levels progress, the terrain and enemies are mixed up differently, and eventually you get multiple enemies per level. The planes are the most tricky ones. The submarines and tanks can usually be dealt with by staying just above the horizon and using your missiles. The enemy can fire back, and a message will flash on screen to inform you of this. And if not destroyed, the missile, or as it's called in this game, the Exotron, can do serious damage to your shield. You can also crash into the ground if you fly too low, something you have to keep in mind while tracking the enemy planes as they dive in. The refugees either walk along the ground or are sat in boats, sometimes waving at you, which is a fun addition. If they get hit, either by you or the enemy fire, they leap into the air and die, or slowly sink into the sea. This 3D shooter is, in my opinion, one of the better imagined games. The graphics are nice and smooth, the sound is good, and playability is top notch. I spent ages playing this game when it first came out, and once I got used to controls again, I lost over an hour blasting away, and saving the refugees. A great all-round game, especially for 1983. After Zoom there was a long break of about five months, with Imagine not putting anything out, even missing the lucrative Christmas period, which in software terms is the peak time to sell games. As 1984 arrived, Imagine were back. The next two games released in January 1984 gave us two completely different formats. Alchemist was Imagine's first foray into the new trendy arcade adventure market. Some versions came with a gold cassette, supposedly to emphasise the idea of the game name, but strangely this is not an element of the game itself. You play a wizard depicted by a large sprite that has the ability to change into an eagle. This can be used to navigate sections that the human form cannot get to. The idea is that you've been summoned to do battle with an evil warlock, and to defeat him you must collect four sections of a magic scroll scattered within the castle. Picking up one piece at a time, you have to return it to a specific location, where it can be joined with the others ready to use. The warlock has sent enemies to kill you of course, but luckily you have a lightning bolt to fight back with, and there are also other weapons scattered about and spells that you can use. You also have to keep an eye on your health, and pick up any food you find lying about. Overall, a change in direction for Imagine, moving away from straight action games into a more puzzle role-playing graphic adventure. When I first bought this I failed to see the attraction, but after watching the RZX and reading up, and finding out what you're supposed to do, it made my review playing much more fun. A nice departure then, but one that would inevitably not save them. Next came Stonkers, in yet another direction for the company. Instead of giving us arcade games or arcade adventures, they moved into strategy war games. The aim was simple, defeat the computer controlled forces within the map provided. The game is less than simple though, and involves controlling infantry, artillery and tank divisions, not only to attack and destroy the opposition, but also protect important areas such as the port. The port is essential, as it is used to supply your enemy with provisions. Without it your enemy will slowly grind to a halt, and eventually disband. Of course the enemy has the same problems, so obviously attacking their port would be a good plan, that is, if the opponent hasn't placed divisions there to guard it. There's also a bridge, which is quite important to take control of. You can view the entire map, or zoom into areas and see what your troops are doing, and also what your enemy are doing. You can issue orders to move individual units around, and should the two sides get close enough, a battle will commence. 
The winner would be decided on a whole range of statistics like numbers of units and firepower and of course supplies. This is by no means a fast paced game, but then again it's not meant to be. A full game can take a while to play through, as you have to try and outthink and outmaneuver your enemy. Not really my cup of tea, but not a bad game, and something different that most other companies were not releasing at the time. This game also had a bad reputation for being very buggy, and always crashing. And true to form, as I was recording this review, just about as my troops were starting to kick off, the inevitable happened. Oh well, you can't win them all. Next came Pedro. This was originally to be part of the Marshall Cavendish deal, and was to accompany a new magazine called Input. The game, however, was rejected because it wasn't up to scratch. You control a Mexican gardener who has to protect his prized plants from the marauding animals and the local tramp. To do this, you use bricks or compost from the lower corners of the screen to block up the entrances to the garden. This can stop the animals getting in for a short period of time. Should they get past these, though, they'll start eating the plants straight away. At this point, Pedro can chase them away or even jump on them. There is a box of seeds there that he can use to replant the crop, but there's always the local tramp who wants to sneak in and steal them for himself. The graphics are not very good. Yes, they're smooth, but the colours make it look like a game that you've typed in from a magazine. The garden is shown in a sort of isometric 3D view, but that just gets in the way, and I think it could have been much better had it been viewed straight down. Control is tricky because of this, and you have to align Pedro exactly before you can pick up bricks or compost or seeds. Meanwhile, your crop is being ravaged by the various animals. Sound is poor, hardly anything at all really, and all in all you can see why Marshall Cavendish rejected it. As this game was launched, the signs were beginning to be seen that Imagine were in trouble, and losing this contract didn't help. To try and get some money back, they released Pedro as a standalone game, but obviously it didn't do very well. At this point they began to advertise the Mega Games, and Imagine were putting most of their eggs into the same basket, while at the same time struggling to keep revenue coming in. Now at this point in Imagine's history, there's some conjecture as to which the official last game was, especially when you take into account the company was wound up on July 9th. There are two contenders. Firstly, Cosmic Cruiser, released in or around June or July, depending on where you get your information from. Cosmic Cruiser was certainly the first one to be released, and featured the new cassette design, which lends credence to the fact that this game was not part of the previous collection, or it could have been that Imagine were just trying to up their game and bring some new attention to their packaging. This was, however, a time of turmoil at Imagine, with the company in the process of being wound up with legal threats mounting. So the game itself is pretty poor, in almost every aspect. In particular, and most importantly, gameplay. The idea is to blast holes in the large alien ship, and then fly up inside. Once inside the ship, you have to rescue prisoners, and return them to your own ship. Shooting the doors open is fairly easy. Getting into the ship is fairly easy. Rescuing anyone is almost impossible. Time after time you get caught by the aliens, and that sounds pretty painful. If you are unlucky enough to collide with an alien outside of the ship, they just grab you and take you for a ride around the screen, going nowhere in particular. And there's nothing you can do once they've got you. Just wait to die and start again. Animation is sometimes jerky and sound is terrible. What were Imagine really thinking? Was this a rush game just to get something onto the shelves? It certainly feels like it and it was very disappointing. Bill, released in or around August-October, which was after the company was wound up. But whether or not this came from the Imagine stable is still up for debate, but I would say that there were a couple of names in the credits that were also responsible for Cosmic Cruiser. The game begins with a nice tune and a control selection. It took me a while to get through this and I had to read the instructions. Apparently once you've made a selection you have to press Y to start the game. The idea is that Bill has to go around clubbing women on the head and dragging them back to his cave for some prehistoric romance. Once he has one or more women in there, kids start appearing, and all of them need feeding. 
So, Gil has to go around clubbing various animals and dragging them back to the cave to feed them. There are a few dinosaurs that you have to avoid, otherwise it's game over. The game is much more playable than Cosmic Cruiser, although by no means perfect. The game slows down when there's a lot happening on screen. However, the controls are still responsive, and you can still get a few minutes play out of it. The sound is good, as are the graphics and animation, and there's some nice music too. Overall, though, it's a below average game, even for 1984. Imagine as a company lasted just 20 months and produced 11 or 12 games and collapsed in spectacular fashion. Their much hyped mega games never saw the light of day and the company name and assets were bought by Beaujolais, who quickly put out cheap compilations using the familiar label. The name Imagine lived on though through various publishers producing some nice games but the true Imagine games are all in this feature. The company, the hype, the artwork, the marketing and the games encompassed that period in computer history and fueled many debates and it certainly left its mark in history. Well that's the end of this episode and this series. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help making the next series get in touch by the details below. See you soon. <laughs>